So after this session, inshallah, we should be able to realize why there is differences, where did they stem up from, and uh, is it correct to have differences or not, what taqlid is, and that it was practiced at the time of the Sahaba and the Tabi'un. What should our intention be? Our intention should be, inshallah, to please Allah Azza wa Jal first of all, and to learn and practice fit of the salafs, right? And in that is uh, correctness and success. Allah Azza wa Jal has promised success in that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also has promised success in that. If you move away from the sunnah or the, 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 the path of the salaf, that's misguidance and it, it, it's dangerous. One thing we should not uh, go away from here is with the mind and the idea that now that I have enough bullets to go and um, attack those who probably, for whatever reason, do not believe in taqlid, that should not be our intention and this is not the, the reason why we are having such a seminar, but in reality it's just to clarify certain discussions we might have or certain doubts and unease that we might have in, in, in this particular topic. Terminologies that are used when discussing um, taqlid, mazahir, the first one is, of course, ikhtilaf. What is ikhtilaf? Ikhtilaf is when parts are different but the goal is one. So everybody's goal is to meet Allah Azza wa Jal. Everybody's goal is to uh, practice the deen based on Quran and Sunnah. And uh, nobody's goal should be to, to cause conflict, disunity, hatred uh, in, in following the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore the definition of istilaf will be when the paths are different but the goal is one. Hence the opposite of ikhtilaf is khilaf. When a person differs to cause conflict, when a person differs to cause disunity and hatred, that will be the opposite of ikhtilaf, which is called khilaf. So, let's take an example of when the paths are different but the goal is one. If a person resides in a community where the Shafi sits, for example, is pregnant and he himself is a Hanafi and he has to go and face a Shafi judge. And the Shafi judge passes a verdict from the Shafi mother, he who is a Hanafi has to follow that verdict. He cannot change that verdict because he's a Hanafi. Okay? So the goal is what? Because this person, the Qazi, his goal is to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His school of thought might be different, but this Hanafi Muqallid, who is in front of this Qazi, has to follow that particular uh, uh, judgment by the Qazi. However, if somebody, for example, was passed as a judge, Allah doesn't know why he's a judge, but if he passes a judgment based on khilaf, then the ulama of that community will override that judgment and the judgment based on the uh, he will be given. So that's ikhtilaf. The next sort of uh, terminology that's used is ra'yuf. The next is ra'yuf. Uh, that means I, I can take extra time, I won't get a yellow card. <laughs> right. Okay. Our ra'yuf, the definition of our ra'yuf is the heart sees something to be correct after pondering and much thought while seeking the truth in matters that are conflicting. What that means is a person, he looks into sharia, he wants to come to a conclusion. Okay? And he sees many conflicting riwayat, narrations of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the sahaba radiallahu anhu. Okay? So what he does is he sits with all of the narrations in front of him and he has to come to a judgment. So the first of all, the first condition is he's seeking the truth. Okay, he's not seeking what his heart desires or what his nuts want, but what is the truth. The second is, he does a lot of thinking and a lot of pondering, so he has to look at all the narrations in front of him before he can make that, uh, come to a conclusion. So he can't take, for example, two or three hadith and then, whereas there's about 15 narrations to a particular issue and make a conclusion. That will not be right and that will be incorrect to do. Therefore, uh, many times we hear certain uh, people making comments that uh, 
certain hadith probably did not reach a particular mujtahid, to make a statement like that would be incorrect because a mujtahid cannot impart a judgment without looking at all the narrations in front of him. And that is probably why at the time of Imam Abu Hanifa, the people called him Ahlul Rai, the man with the opinion, because he probably was the best at doing that. And then later on, this term, Sahib or Ashab or Rai, was given to the Hanafiya. So probably it was because that we actually did that the best. Okay? So that was the terminology of Rai. And Ibn Qayyim, he, this is his definition of, of, of Rai. Then you have Taqlid, Mufti Sahib, uh, he has actually given the definition of that, accepting the view of a Muslim. <laughs> right. Um, so Taqlid then would be accepting the view of a Mujtahid on issues of Islam without seeking truth. So basically, your heart feels and you're confident that this person I'm going to follow is correct, therefore I do not need to seek proof on the judgment that this person passes. Just a, a, a simple example of that would be when a person registers with a particular doctor, he's confident that that doctor will sort of uh, diagnose him properly, he's confident with, with, with the qualifications of a particular doctor. Nobody goes to the doctor when the doctor prescribes the medicine and goes, give me proof. In which book is it? <laughs> right? We don't do that. And if a person does that, I can guarantee he'll be removed from the office of the doctor. But uh, that, 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 that's the clear. Accepting the view of a mujtahid on issues of Islam without seeking truth. The next um, topic that we, we're going to move on to is istinab between the Sahaba radiallahu anhu and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's approval. Meaning, was there ikhtilaf within the Sahaba at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Um, and if there was, how did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, deal with them? So the first one is very famous incident that once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a group of Sahaba radiallahu anhu to a place uh, where the Banu Quraysh, the Jewish tribe, resided. And that area then became famously known as Banu Quraysh. Just uh, quickly, historically, in Medina to Munawara, there were three uh, Jewish tribes, Banu Nazir, Banu Qaynuka, and Banu uh, Quraysh. So Rasulullah sent uh, this group of Sahaba to Banu Quraysh. And then he told them, لا تصلى العصر إلا في بني قريزة But do not pray your asr except in بني قريزة So the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم, they moved on the journey and then Asr Salah came in Actually Asr Salah was about to actually end So then amongst them an ikhtilaf broke up So one group of Sahaba said that we should pray our asr now and not let, it, uh, let, let the time of asr go up and another group of Sahaba, they said, no, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us to pray Asr Salah in Banu Quraiza. Therefore, even if it's Asr Salah is finished, still we will pray our Asr in Banu Quraiza. So, for example, if they were to uh, 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 arrive at Banu Quraiza at Isha Tat, they'll do the Asr there. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that do not pray Asr except in Banu Quraiza. The first group of Sahaba, they said Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that لا تصل العصر إلا في بنو قريزة that do not pray your asr except in بنو قريزة What he meant by that is make your journey swift and quick so that you reach بنو قريزة before asr That's how they explained that particular hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So what happened? A group of Sahaba, they prayed their asr and the other group carried on and they all met up in بنو قريزة when they came back and they mentioned this whole incident to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah sallam did not recommend any of them. Nor did he say you're correct and you're incorrect, any of that. Meaning that this ikhtilaf that you had was fine. He didn't even move on to say actually what I meant by this was this thing. Okay? That read your asr in Banu Quraiza, that's what I meant. If I said that to you, that's what I meant. Nor did Rasulullah sallam actually I meant that, okay, be quick and get. He didn't explain that term, which meant 
that if there was ikhtilaf based on riwaya, based on hadith, to have that sort of ikhtilaf as long as it is ikhtilaf is fine. As long as it is ikhtilaf, it's fine. So what is um, not permissible is to have khilaf. Okay? The next one is which is quite uh, amazing and fascinating this one. Is in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a woman that's been uh, given divorce. So how long should she wait before she can get married again? So Allah Azza wa Jal mentions Salata Taquru. Now the famous uh, muhaddith uh, in Medina Munawwara, Sheikh Awama, he's written a book, um, Adab al Iskila. And in that book he mentions a discussion that took place between him and a student. And a student came up and he said that ikhtilaf is bad. So Sheikh Awama uh, Mr. Ibadi, mashallah, very great muhaddith. Uh, our Ustaz Mahathir Rahman Al Azmi always uh, talks about him. He's a student of Sheikh Abdul Fattah Al Buddha. So he went on to a sort of uh, uh, a thought. So how can I answer this particular student? So he came up with this. So he said, if ikhtilaf was bad, Allah Azza wa Jal would have known it. And he would not let it happen in his deen. Especially in the Quran. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran mentions Salata Tafuru. That this particular woman, before she can get married, she has to wait three periods. Now, what do they mean by three periods? If the Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he talks, he says that Furu means three menstruation periods. So, after three men's cycles, can this woman get married again? David al Sabit, on the other hand, he took Furu to mean purity. So after each menstruation cycle, when a woman gets pure, then after those three periods, this woman can get the married. Everybody that that's clear? Yeah. Right? Uh, so, Shaykh Awama says, so if Allah Azza wa Jal, or if ikhtilaf was evil, then Allah Azza wa Jal would not have permitted in the Quran, because Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala would have known that if I said Salasa Tafuru, then I would have ended up with the Sahabi for Ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud, and he would have said that Furu means menstruation, and another Sahabi, Zayd Ibn Sabi, he would have explained Furu to be purity. And I can easily end this ikhtilaf by saying Salasa Tuhiya, with three menstruation periods, or Salasa Tuhiya, with three uh, purity periods, and ikhtilaf is finished, khalas. Then we don't have to go into this whole, uh, whole lengthy discussion. And this discussion is very long. Okay? But however, Allah Azza wa Jal, from His wisdom, He mentioned Salata Taqru, so that two Sahaba can have that difference. Okay? I myself <coughs> sat down once and I thought, what is the wisdom of Ikhtilaf? Okay? And this is from myself, therefore, there's great scope of it being wrong. And if it is uh, wrong, Allah Azza wa Jal should forgive me. Um, and if it is correct, it's from the ability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, I ask Allah to fear. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم فَوَعْتَصِمُ بِحَبِّ اللَّهِ جَلِيعًا That uh, ayat, that grab onto the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not be disunited. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Remember you were at one time in the brinks of Jahannam and I took you and I bonded you with love. فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُرُوبِينَ That I bonded your heart with love. <coughs> okay? And the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal is to test us. In Surah Munt, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I've created life and left to test you who comes with the best of actions. So our life in this world is a life of test. And every ahkam of Allah Azza wa Jal, law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is here to test us. Therefore, this is a test of do we make tafarruq and start hating each other or do we have love amongst ourselves even though we have ikhtilaf. And this is the test. That am I, can I sit with a person that totally disagrees with whether my salat is correct or not and can I share food with him? 
Or can I have a discussion with someone, have a heated debate, a lengthy debate, and at the end this person turns around and you're still wrong? Can I get up from that message and hug him still? Or would I start calling him names? Or would I start personal, per, per, uh, personal assassination? Okay. Character. Character after that, do I start doing that? Do I start writing volumes about this person's character? Or do, I, do, we, do we have love? Even though we have Islam. So that, that is the, the, the hikmah behind having Islam. That is the test. That can we love each other? And this whole deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is based on brotherhood, mercy and love. That's a different discussion altogether. Um, the next is um, examples of taqlid in the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. So, were all the Sahaba mujtahidun, did they have their own madhab each or did they follow each other? Okay, Mufti Sadruddin have also uh, shed light to that and this is the same discussion. So this is one example where the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were not all mujtahid, they did not all open up Quran and Hadith to take out fiqh, there was very specific Sahaba radiallahu anhum that were, uh, had expertise in the field of ijtihad and the rest of them just followed. This is an example. The people of Medina asked Ibn Abbas anh, uh, about the ruling of a woman who makes her first tawaf around the Kaaba and then after she experiences her menses. Okay, so uh, should she make the final tawaf or not? Ibn Abbas told her that she may go home without making the final tawaf and they just straight up replied to him, you know what, actually we're never going to follow your verdict and leave the verdict of Zayd ibn uh, Zayd ibn Thabit. Okay? Ibn Abbas did not have a problem with the radiallahu anhu. As long as they were following someone, he didn't have a problem. But what he did do is he said, when you go back to Medina, inquire from him. So, okay, ask Zayd ibn Thabit which one really is correct. But the people of Medina knew that Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu follow the idea that no, this woman will have to wait till her menses is finished, do the tawaf and then return home. Therefore they were ready to take the 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 the, 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 the ijtihad or the research of Ibn Abbas radiallahu an. In a riwayah, in another riwayah of this instance, this is in Bukhari Sharif, but in another riwayah which has a slight detail, he actually tells them that there is a hadith of Ibn Salim, uh, uh, Sulaim, sorry, uh, on this point, that Ibn Sulaim uh, experienced and Rasulullah told her to go home. Still too they did not uh, 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 take his uh, word for it and they stuck to the uh, to the Muslim of Zayd ibn Sabi. Again, to follow someone without seeking proof. They were confident in Zayd ibn Sabi and they did it. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, did not have a problem with it. If istilaf and following someone was evil, he would have turned around and told them, look I'm giving it Zaneel and you're still not accepting he was fine. And if the Abbas radiallahu anh was, we will, we will see that he was one of those Sahaba that uh, had the caliber of Ijtihad and actually used to give fatwa in uh, the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The second example is Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh who discussed his views of the views for the views of those Sahaba he felt most worthy. So there were certain Sahaba that uh, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh who felt that they were high in caliber in knowledge than himself, he would discard his view and follow their view without questioning. Abu Bakr radiallahu anh was one of them, Ali radiallahu anh was another one of those Sahaba, the Sahabi that Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh would discard his um, uh, opinion and follow uh, this. Abu Musa radiallahu anh would discard his views for the views of Ali radiallahu anh he would also do the same for Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. And um, there is a discussion where <coughs> Yes, there is it. So Imam Bukhari rahimahullah narrates that uh, some people ask Abu Musa Ash'ari radiallahu an a question in inheritance. And Abdul ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was present and Abu Musa Ash'ari knew the answer to the question. 
However, he did not answer the question when he told the people that go to Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an and pose the question to him. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an answered the question and he conflicted to Abu Musa Ash'ari. Abu Musa Ash'ari radiallahu an did not negate that and he kept quiet. He allowed the people to follow the ijtihad of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. So here again, to follow a particular one person in the field of fiqh, it is fine, and we've seen it at the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. Right, despite the fact both of them have this vast amount of knowledge, they still too make the police. So, in our time, our knowledge is confined, very specific, very basic. We, on a higher uh, reasoning, should do the police of those who had vast amount of knowledge and who were uh, certified uh, to, to, to be mujtahidun. We move on. <coughs> the Fuqaha amongst the Sahaba of Allah. Mufti Sadruddin Sad mentioned, I mentioned to you earlier, that not all Sahaba of Allah were mujtahid. Not all of them, all of them were tafiq. Not all of them had, were certified to uh, uh, give fatwa. So there were few Sahaba uh, uh, amongst the majority of the Sahaba of Allah that had the authority of giving fatwa. And there were 130 Mustun. Mustun is the school of Mufti uh, amongst the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And they were divided into three categories. Mukassirun, those who spent most of their time giving fatwa. So their mashwala, their occupation was giving fatwa. Few examples of them were Umar ibn Khattab, Ali radiallahu anhu, Ibn Mas'ud, and surprisingly Aisha radiallahu anha who was a female, and that, that um, our sisters should take lessons from that. Mukassirun, they were uh, giving a vast amount of, uh, their mashwala uh, and occupation was in giving special answering questions and uh, legal ruling. Then you had Mutawasbit, they would sometimes give fatwa, <coughs> not all the time, sometimes. So a media stature of, 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 of the time, uh, so Amongst them are Abu Bakr, Uthman, Anas, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. And then you had Muqallif, they would occasionally give fatwa. And amongst them Abu Dharda, Abu Ubaidah, and surprisingly also in that category is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He was a very Allah fearing person. Uh, 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 and he would seldom quote hadith and he would seldom give fatwa as well. And that's one of the reasons why Abu, Abu Hanifa Allah, rahimahullah, would seldom be quote hadith because uh, of the fear that what if it would be correct. That's why um, uh, he, he seldom be quote hadith. However, he was the child of hadith and uh, he, he produced a great muhadith one. So now, how did the Fuqaha from the Muslims. Okay, so now we finish with the era and the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. We are moving on to the time of the Tabi'i. So how and what principles did they use to uh, 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 to make up their Muslims? So after the era of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, it was spread through how the Muslim world to mainly five Sahaba. Okay, so that, what that means is that the Fuqaha to form their madhab and codify fiqh because fiqh at that time was scattered okay and there wasn't anything in system so at the time of the time you wrote namely Imam Abu Hanifa uh, and others they got together to give a system to fiqh and inshallah later on when we do the definition of fiqh you will see that how because of the system of fiqh changing how the definition of fiqh changed amongst the fuqaha however at this time at the time of the time you wrote, because they have uh, uh, wanted to now codify and give assistance of fiqh, each area took the fiqh of the Sahaba that was in that particular area. So we have, number one, the people of Medina learned and followed the fiqh of the students of Zayd ibn Sabit and ibn Umar radiallahu anh. That's why in Medina, to Munawwara, the fiqh of these two Sahaba were, were, were famous uh, and spread. Okay, and Imam Malik gave his preference to the Amr of uh, the people of Medina based on that. Number two, the people of Mecca learned and followed the fiqh and the students of Abdullah ibn Abbas And number three, the people of Iraq learned and followed the fiqh of the students of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Ali radiallahu anhu. Hence, if you look at the Hanafi Madhab, 
you will see that majority of the fiqh of the Hanafi Madhab have been taken from Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh and Ali radiallahu anh. And it was codified in that way because uh, it was easily accessible to take fiqh from those particular Sahaba, they took fiqh from those particular Sahaba. And we've seen that among the Sahaba radiallahu anh, they had extreme differences. Therefore, each area, because of the Sahabi that was living in that area, they had a whole different uh, uh, style to fit. Examples of taqlid in the time of the Sabi'un, radiallahu anhum wa rahimahumullah. One um, example here is Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, rahimahumullah. He told one of his students, that Yunus ibn Ziyad, that uh, after you eat something that's been cooked on a fire, you must repeat your wudu, you must make your wudu. Yunus rahimahullah turned around and tells his student's teacher, he tells his teacher that I will not follow your opinion and give up the opinion of Sayyid ibn Musayyib. And you know what? Zuhri kept quiet. Just imagine two students come and tell you, you know what, I'm not going to accept your opinion. Right? That, 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 is ikhlas. That is ikhlas. It is ikhtilas. And that is what it, we should bring into ourselves. That this teacher was fine. That okay, as long as he's following somebody of authority, finished. It's okay. Alhamdulillah. As long as he's not doing something that's totally against the manhaj, the system of, 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 of usul of sharia, of the principles of sharia. Okay, he kept quiet. This is after the hadith of sharia. Uh, another kitab that's written by Sheikh Awama and anybody that can read Arabic I would advise you to sort of get those two books and have a good read of them Adab al ikhtilaf is one and Asr wa Hadith is Sharif I don't know if both of them have been translated but uh, hope someone does it Right, uh, okay, now certain statements regarding uh, so some statements of the uh, Muhajjitun uh, about uh, uh, the, uh, the first one is At-Taslim lil-Fuqa'a Salama Fiddin At-Taslim lil-Fuqa'a Salama Fiddin To submit to a Fati is safety in Deen To submit to a Fati is safety in Deen Okay? This is uh, Sufyan ibn Uriyena, a great uh, Sabi'i He says that to, to, to give yourself to a Fati and follow his fiqh without you making the research is salama, is safety indeed because you will not be questioned about that however if you go into taqlid, if you go into ijtihad you will be questioned uh, 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 regarding that that's, that's one of the reasons why even the Imam Suyuti rahimahullah came to the caliber of ijtihad right? he didn't do his ijtihad, he was a shafi'i fil madhab he followed the fiqh of Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah and that's permissible, that's fine and actually that's uh, recommended Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah says in Tirmidhi Sharif after discussing a particular hadith and, uh, and, and the, the, the fiqh behind that hadith he says وَكَذَانِ قَالَ الْفُقَهَا وَهُمْ أَعْلَمْ بِمَعَانِ الْحَدِيثِ He says that this is how the ulama and the fuqaha have interpreted this particular uh, 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 the meaning of the hadith and they are the most knowledgeable people regarding hadith again to give yourself up to, 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 to the statement and then the fit of the of the fuqaha. Okay, now this is what I mentioned earlier on. The evolution of the definition of fit. So how did the how uh, did the definition of fit change? Imam Abu Hanifa, who was a tabi'i, okay. Uh, born in uh, 18, uh, 18 the uh, uh, he, he defined fifth uh, as Marifatun Nafs Malaha Wama Alayha. Okay? Now, remember at that time, fiqh, the codification of fiqh just started. So, a person, a fatih, his caliber will be different to the fatih of uh, uh, the fatih we know now. So he says that fiqh is to know what is good for the self and what is against it or the rights of the self. What does that mean? If we take the first definition, what is good for the self, yani in akhirah. 
So what can the self do that because of which he will get Jannah? Or what can the self do because or can't do or shouldn't do because of which it will get Jahannam if it does do that? So that's uh, 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 one. And the other is the rights of the self. Meaning, what rights do I have for other people? And what rights do people have upon me? If you take that particular definition, then you will see that Tafsir, Aqidah, Kalam, Tasawwuf, Fiqh, Sharia, all fall under this particular definition. Therefore, a person to be a Fati at that time had to know Ilm al Aqidah, Ilm al Kalam. Obviously, in Mustafsir, he had to be a Sufi, he had to know Tasawwuf so that he knew what is good for the heart in the sense of spirituality and what is bad for the heart. So, all this, so it was a very general definition that encompassed a lot of. Uh, scholarship for a person to be a Tafi. Now you can understand, you can understand what type of Fuqaha they were and why they were given the title of a Mujtahid. Then we have Imam Shafi rahimahullah, he was born 150 after Hijri. Imam Hanifa died the same year. Uh, There's a small Latifa in that, right? Uh, a small joke that the Fuqaha mentioned. Uh, they say that uh, Imam Shafi waited to be born after the death of Imam Hanifa. He was a bit scared. <laughs> right. So he, he defines fiqh as al ilm bi ahkam al sharia al amaliya min adillati al tafsiliya. So he says now, ilm is to do with the ahkam of sharia amaliya action. So it's no longer to do with belief. So aqidah is now taken out from this definition. It's to do with more action. From its detailed proof, yani from the... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Here we are. Right. Okay. Uh, so it's to more to do with practice from the detailed proof of sharia. So you have Quran, you have hadith, you take the detail because now usul al-fiqh has been codified. Hadith to somewhat have been now put into kutub or into books. Alright? The Quran Sharif obviously in the time of Surah Abu Hanifa Rahimahullah and prior to that was already uh, in, a, in a book form. But uh, now that you have the principles of fiqh, it, for, for, for a person to be a faqi, he has to know the fiqh on the action. So that will be ibadat and mu'amalat. That will be the worship and a person dealing with others. And that fifth will be taken up from detailed proof from the Quran and Hadith. So they will do a detailed research. They will delve into Hadith and, 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 and then they will take out fifth. That's one of the reasons why fifth was given the name fifth. Because if you take the literal meaning of fifth, it means to crack or to open up. So a faqih will crack open the Dalai and from the core of the Dalai he'll take up Masai. That's why uh, if you say for example the, the, the famous hadith uh, of uh, when Rasulullah went to visit the Sahabi, his name was Rumay and he was very upset because his bird died. Okay? So Rasulullah said to cheer him up said, Ya Rumay, ma fa'ila bin Rumay, now what happened to Rumay? Okay? Um, from this particular hadith, Fuqaha have taken up approximately amongst the ikhtilaf 75 to 150 uh, Dalai, uh, 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 Masai. Okay, from just that one statement. And one of them is, one of them is, is Medina haram or not? We know Makkah is haram, haram al Makki. Is Does Medina have the same caliber as Makkah to Mukarrama? And the Hanafiya used this to say that no, it's not because in Makkah to Mukarrama you are not allowed to cage animals of Makkah to Mukarrama. Whereas in Makkah to Mukarrama, with this particular Sahabi, he caged up a bird and Rasulullah is fine with it. And therefore, Madinah to Munawara is not the Haram as Makkah is. So both of them should be respected because of, 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 of uh, two walks of circus. So that's the Adilat wa Tafsiliya, to take out the, the fifth root. And then you come Alam al Damashari, who later on, uh, he defines fifth now, Ma'rifatu ahkamul hawadis 
naqsan wa istimbatan ala madhabin min al madhahib now in the definition of fiqh madhab is now mentioned so now who would be a faqi a faqi would be a person who knows the laws that arise in a particular era so if a masala arises a problem arises an issue arises in a particular era this person can confront it solve it how not from using the sharia text namely quran hadith ijma and qiya istimbatan using the principles of fiqh from a masala from the madai so his principle of fiqh has to be derived from a particular moment. Sure. Okay. Right. So then, to know the ruling of issues that arise at, a, at any time from the text and extracting them according to the principles of a Muslim from the Malahib that a person has. Uh, uh, prevalent at that time. Okay. And I'm going to end with this. Um, probably one of the other scholars will do a detailed analysis of this. But um, I, I was forced to do this when somebody actually said something really strange. Um, people accused of Imam Hanifa giving preference to Qiyas over Hadith. How true is that? And uh, is that uh, a, a sound accusation to make? Is it a correct accusation to make? I want to deal with that now. Somebody actually mentioned to me that the 65% of the Hanafi Masab is based on Qiyas. What he tried to say was that Rasulullah gave preference to his own logic over Hadith. Na'udhu Billahi Min Zalik. And that is against the caliber of Imam Hanifa rahimahullah. Whereas the definition of Qiyas we find we want to is, is to come to a new ruling looking at Quran and Hadith. That's the definition of Qiyas given by the Fuqaha. So, if you take that definition, Qiyas is recommendable and should be done. Otherwise, me and you, in this sense, you will be stuck. Okay? So say, for example, hunting with a gun or not, is it permissible or not? Alright, they didn't have guns at that time. So a person that gives a fatwa of that, what are you going to say? So Qiyas, is recommendable as long as it's done based on its usuls, its principles, and the principle is that qiyas could stem from Quran and Hadith uh, and not from anything else. So, let's hold that up and then uh, actually no, let's do one more. What happened was, Allama Baqir rahimahullah, who was the uh, president of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he found Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. And uh, this, this accusation actually stems up from the time of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. And uh, this, this should be a different discussion, it, it's going to be time consuming. Uh, that's why we're not going to move into it. But people, ulama have dealt with it. These, all these um, issues stem up from the time of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. So, um, Hazrat uh, Baqir rahimahullah finds Imam Abu Hanifa and he tells Imam Abu Hanifa that at first, that you give preference over uh, preference to Qiyas over Hadith. So Imam Hanifa says, how can I do that? How can I give preference to my logic over your grandfather sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So he tells them, Hazrat Atir rahimahullah radiallahu anh, that you sit down. And he gave him a very high platform due to the respect of his, his lineage and where he's coming from. And then he says this. He says that, a woman in inheritance, should she get one share and a man get two? So Allah uh, Baqir said, yes, definitely. So Imam Hanifa said, that's what your grandfather said. However, I want to ask you a question, who's stronger? So Hazrat Baqir rahimahullah said that a man is stronger and a woman is weaker. So he said, that based on that, logic says that the man should get one share because he's got strength to work and make effort so that he can fulfill the other half and get two shares whereas the woman is weak, she can't work so she can't suffice with one share, give her two right? so however, I cannot give preference to Qiyas over Hadith therefore, I have also stipulated two shares for men, for men and one share for women Qiyas says that women should get two shares, men should get, men should get one 
ואז עושה עם אבו חניפה להזדהות את זה. ו... Right, then he asked the second question. He said, what is greater, Salat or Sob? So he replied that obviously Salat. So Imam Hanifa then said that when a woman finishes her menstruation cycle, what should she do? Should she read the mid-Salat or not? Some of the Bakr says she shouldn't. So he said, what about Sob, fasting? And then the Bakr says she should uh, make Qaza of the fasting. So he said, That if Salat is better than Sol, Qiyas will sort of force me to say that she needs to repeat her Salat because that is more better and more important than and not her Sol. However, Rasulullah did not say that, so I can't say that either. Then he said that uh, what uh, uh, impure? Urine or uh, of semen? So, uh, uh, the says, so he said that okay, when a person um, uh, 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 urinates, should he make ghusl? He said no, he should make wudu. And how about if a person um, uh, uh, is actually semen, then um, what should he do? He should make ghusl. So he said, Imam Hanifa said that if I give preference to qiyas, over hadith, I would have said a person after urinating should make ghusl and after a person ejaculate exactly semen, I should make ghusl. However, I can't do that because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not do that. If anyone has a question on the presentation, questions that come from the later section, so start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahman. These are the questions that come from the later section. Um, the first one is that why can't we have much studies today? We can have much studies today. But whoever traversed that door did not pass it through safely. Okay? If we look at history of knowledge, you would find that as eras passed, generations passed, our capacity of Recalling has become weaker. Our teaching is to celebrate, our memory has become jambata. Okay? Full of jam and butter. It, it stops us from, from thinking. Okay? And and Sabib uh, 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 used to say, Yakum wal bitl fa inna wa kusib al fitr. That beware of filling up your stomach because that corrupts the mind. Okay? That's what we are engrossed in. And that's why our mind is so all, all corrupted. So, um, for a person to become a mujtahid, they have to um, learn all the sciences to do sharia. So they have to know tafsir without tafsir. So they cannot follow somebody else's tafsir. They have to be able to make tafsir on their own. So they should know those laws that Allah has abrogated and which one abrogated what. It's called nafiq mansu. They have to know ilm al aqaid, ilm al kalam, right? The, 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 the belief, the, the belief. They obviously have to know hadith. Under hadith, there is about 17 different sciences which have been sort of simplified into five. Namely, ilm al riwayat. They have to memorize hadith. A person came to Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and he followed 10,000. Would that be a mujta? He said no. 20,000? He said no. 40,000, he said no, 70,000, and he said something like that, maybe. Okay, so that, that's also another. And then Ziraya, you have to know the explanation of the hadith. So if two hadiths are conflicting, and you're going to give preference over one, why? You have to know the tarikh of riwayah, you have to know the date of riwayah, which hadith came first, and the other, and why? Okay, so I'm just going to base it on which Sahabi became Muslim first or not, who saw Rasulullah first or not, or what basis are you going to base your, 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 your decision on, on which hadith came first or not. Ilm of Tajweed, and that includes the 10 Qira'at, okay, to learn one is difficult, you have to know all 10. So, so, so it's, it's a very difficult journey, and it's a very time consuming one as well. Uh, I will start after showing us Ahmed Shakir's uh, book on uh, tarikh, on history, on the Islamic world. And what he's done is uh, famously, brilliantly, 
He's taken each country, Islamic country, from where it was prior to Rasulullah from time till the democratic era. And he's not, it's not in the 18 volumes. So our teacher used to tell us that they had time to write 18 volumes. We don't even have time to read one volume. Okay? So, so that, that's, that's our situation. That's why we can't have Mujtahid today. And when a person becomes Mujtahid, if he wants his mother to be followed, he has to codify it. He has to have all the usuls written down. He has to have all the juice. He has all the fit written down. So after learning everything, he has to spend a lifetime writing it. So you need two lifetimes, basically. So coming back, the door still open, but whoever's traversed it has not come out safely. The second question is, if you're a Hanafi, can you follow other Muslims? The safe answer is no. <laughs> Any other questions? The whole idea of uh, following through, moving to one level to another, there's a whole science to itself, it's called Ilm Al-Fiqh. Uh, it was self-self, uh, and, and it's got a whole sort of principles to itself. Uh, and you have to be safe from what they have been enough that your self takes some sort of control over you. And because it's very difficult, and, and we don't have the, uh, the, 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 the scholarship for it, uh, the basic answer is no, it shouldn't be done. <laughs> <laughs>